Chapter 7 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3 by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 A week after the events we have related, as nine o'clock in the evening had just sounded from the castle bell, and the Queen and Mary Seaton were sitting at a table where they were working at their tapestry, a stone thrown from the courtyard passed through the window bars, broke a pane of glass, and fell into the room. The Queen's first idea was to believe it accidental or an insult. But Mary Seaton, turning round, noticed that the stone was wrapped up in a paper. She immediately picked it up. The paper was a letter from George Douglas, conceived in these terms. "'You have commanded me to live, madame. I have obeyed, and your majesty has been able to tell from the Kinross light that your servants continue to watch over you. However, not to raise suspicion, the soldiers collected for that fatal night dispersed at dawn, and will not gather again till a fresh attempt makes their presence necessary. But, alas! To renew this attempt now, when your majesty's jailers are on their guard, would be your ruin. Let them take every precaution, then, madame. Let them sleep in security, while we, we, in our devotion, shall go on watching. Patience and courage. Brave and loyal heart, cried Mary, more constantly devoted to misfortune than others are to prosperity. Yet I shall have patience and courage, and so long as that light shines, I shall still believe in liberty." This letter restored to the queen all her former courage. She had means of communication with George through little Douglas, for no doubt it was he who had thrown that stone. She hastened in her turn to write a letter to George, in which she both charged him to express her gratitude to all the lords who had signed the protestation, and begged them in the name of the fidelity they had sworn to her not to cool in their devotion, promising them for her part to await the result with that patience and courage they asked of her. The queen was not mistaken. Next day, as she was at her window, little Douglas came to play at the foot of the tower, and without raising his head stopped just beneath her to dig a trap to catch birds. The queen looked to see if she were observed, and assured that that part of the courtyard was deserted, she let fall the stone wrapped in her letter. At first she feared to have made a serious error, for little Douglas did not even turn at the noise, and it was only after a moment during which the prisoner's heart was torn with frightful anxiety that, indifferently, and as if he were looking for something else, the child laid his hand on the stone, and, without hurrying, without raising his head, without indeed giving any sign of intelligence to her who had thrown it, he put the letter in his pocket, finishing the work he had begun with the greatest calm, and showing the queen, by this coolness beyond his years, what reliance she could place in him. From that moment the queen regained fresh hope, but days, weeks, months passed, without bringing any change in her situation. Winter came, the prisoners saw snow spread over the plains and mountains, and the lake afforded her, if she had only been able to pass the door, a firm road to gain the other bank. But no letter came during all this time to bring her the consoling news that they were busy about her deliverance. The faithful light alone announced to her every evening that a friend was keeping watch. Soon nature awoke from her death sleep. Some forward sun rays broke through the clouds of this somber sky of Scotland. The snow melted, the lake broke its ice crust. The first buds opened, the green turf reappeared. Everything came out of its prison at the joyous approach of spring, and it was a great grief to Mary to see that she alone was condemned to an eternal winter. At last, one evening she thought she observed in the motions of the light that something fresh was happening. She had so often questioned this poor flickering star, and she had so often let it count her heartbeats more than twenty times, that to spare herself the pain of disappointment, for a long time she had no longer interrogated it. However, she resolved to make one last attempt, and almost hopeless, she put her light near the window and immediately took it away. Still, faithful to the signal, the other disappeared at the same moment, and reappeared at the eleventh heartbeat of the queen. At the same time, by a strange coincidence, a stone passing through the window fell at Mary Seaton's feet. It was, like the first, wrapped in a letter from George. The queen took it from her companion's hands, opened it, and read, "'The moment draws near.' Your adherents are assembled. Summon all your courage. Tomorrow, at eleven o'clock in the evening, drop a cord from your window and draw up the packet that will be fastened to it. There remained in the queen's apartments the rope over and above what had served for the ladder taken away by the guards the evening of the frustrated escape. Next day, at the appointed hour, the two prisoners shut up the lamp in the bedroom so that no light should betray them, and Mary Seaton, approaching the window, let down the cord. After a minute she felt from its movements that something was being attached to it. Mary Seaton pulled, and a rather bulky parcel appeared at the bars, which it could not pass on account of its size. Then the queen came to her companion's aid. The parcel was untied, and its contents, separately, got through easily. 
the two prisoners carried them into the bedroom and barricaded within commenced an inventory there were two complete suits of men's clothes in the douglas livery the queen was at a loss when she saw a letter fastened to the collar of one of the two coats eager to know the meaning of this enigma she immediately opened it and read as follows it is only by dint of audacity that her majesty can recover her liberty let her majesty read this letter then and punctually follow if she deign to adopt them the instructions she will find therein in the daytime the keys of the castle do not leave the belt of the old steward when curfew is rung and he has made his rounds to make sure that all the doors are fast shut he gives them up to william douglas who if he stays up fastens them to his sword belt or if he sleeps put them under his pillow for five months little douglas whom everyone is accustomed to see working at the armorer's forge of the castle has been employing in making some keys like enough to the others once they are substituted for them for william to be deceived yesterday little douglas finished the last on the first favorable opportunity that her majesty will know to be about to present itself by carefully questioning the light each day little douglas will exchange the false keys for the true will enter the queen's room and will find her dressed as well as miss mary seaton in their men's clothing and he will go before them to lead them by the way which offers the best chances for their escape a boat will be prepared and will await them till then every evening as much to accustom themselves to these new costumes as to give them an appearance of having been worn her majesty and miss mary seaton will dress themselves in the suits which they must keep on from nine o'clock till midnight besides it is possible that without having had time to warn them their young guide may suddenly come to seek them it is urgent then that he find them ready the garments ought to fit perfectly her majesty and her companion the measure having been taken on miss mary fleming and miss mary livingston who are exactly their size one cannot too strongly recommend her majesty to summon to her aid on the supreme occasion the coolness and courage of which she has given such frequent proofs at other times the two prisoners were astounded at the boldness of this plan at first they looked at one another in consternation for success seemed impossible they none the less made trial of their disguise as george had said it fitted each of them as if they had been measured for it every evening the queen questioned the light as george had urged and that for a whole long month during which each evening the queen and mary seaton although the light gave no fresh tidings arrayed themselves in their men's clothing as had been arranged so that they acquired such practice that they became as familiar to them as those of their own sex at last the second may fifteen sixty eight the queen was awakened by the blowing of a horn uneasy as to what it announced she slipped on a cloak and ran to the window where mary seaton joined her directly a rather numerous band of horsemen had halted on the side of the lake displaying the douglas pennon and three boats were rowing together and vying with each other to fetch the new arrivals this event caused the queen dismay in her current situation the least change in the castle routine was to be feared for it might upset all the concerted plans this apprehension redoubled when on the boats drawing near the queen recognized in the elder lord douglas the husband of lady lochleven and the father of william and george the venerable knight who was keeper of the marches in the north was coming to visit his ancient manor in which he had not set foot for three years it was an event for lochleven and some minutes after the arrival of the boats mary stuart heard the old steward's footsteps mounting the stairs he came to announce his master's arrival to the queen and as it must needs be a time of rejoicing to all the castle inhabitants when its master returned he came to invite the queen to the dinner in celebration of the event whether instinctively or from distaste the queen declined all day long the bell and the bugle resounded lord douglas like a true feudal lord travelled with the retinue of a prince one saw nothing but new soldiers and servants passing and repassing beneath the queen's windows the footmen and horsemen were wearing moreover a livery similar to that which the queen and mary seaton had received mary awaited the night with impatience the day before she had questioned her light and it had informed her as usual in reappearing at her eleventh or twelfth heartbeat that the moment of escape was near but she greatly feared that lord douglas's arrival might have upset everything and that this evening's signal could only announce a postponement but hardly had she seen the light shine than she placed her lamp in the window the other disappeared directly and mary stuart with terrible anxiety began to question it this anxiety increased when she counted more than fifteen beats then she stopped cast down her eyes mechanically fixed on the spot where the light had been but her astonishment was great when at the end of a few minutes she did not see it reappear and when half an hour having elapsed everything remained in darkness the queen then renewed her signal but obtained no response the escape was for the same evening 
The Queen and Mary Seaton were so little expecting this issue that, contrary to their custom, they had not put on their men's clothes that evening. They immediately flew to the Queen's bedchamber, bolted the door behind them, and began to dress. They had hardly finished their hurried toilet when they heard a key turn in the lock. They immediately blew out the lamp. Light steps approached the door. The two women leaned one against the other, for they both were near falling. Someone tapped gently. The Queen asked who was there, and little Douglas's voice answered in the first two lines of an old ballad. "'Douglas, Douglas, tender and true!' Mary opened directly. It was the watchword agreed upon with George Douglas. The child was without a light. He stretched out his hand and encountered the Queen's. In the starlight Mary Stuart saw him kneel down, and then she felt the imprint of his lips on her fingers. "'Is your Majesty ready to follow me?' he asked in a low tone, rising. "'Yes, my child,' the Queen answered. "'It is for this evening, then?' "'With your Majesty's permission, yes, it is for this evening.' "'Is everything ready?' "'Everything.' What are we to do? Follow me everywhere. Oh, my God, my God, cried Mary Stuart, have pity on us. Then, having breathed a short prayer in a low voice, while Mary Seaton was taking the casket in which were the Queen's jewels, I am ready, said she. And you, darling? I also, replied Mary Seaton. Come then, said little Douglas. The two prisoners followed the child, the Queen going first and Mary Seaton after. Their youthful guide carefully shut again the door behind him, so that if a warder happened to pass he would see nothing. Then he began to descend the winding stair. Halfway down the noise of the feast reached them, a mingling of shouts of laughter, the confusion of voices, and the clinking of glasses. The queen placed her hand on her young guide's shoulder. "'Where are you leading us?' she asked him with terror. "'Out of the castle,' replied the child. "'But we shall have to pass through the great hall.' "'Without a doubt.' and that is exactly what George foresaw. Among the footmen whose livery your majesty is wearing, no one will recognize you. "'My God! My God!' the queen murmured, leaning against the wall. "'Courage, madam,' said Mary Seaton in a low voice. Oh, "'We are lost.' "'You are right,' returned the queen. "'Let us go.' And they started again, still led by their guide. At the foot of the stair he stopped, and giving the queen a stone pitcher full of wine— "'Set this jug on your right shoulder, madam,' said he. "'It will hide your face from the guests, and your majesty will give rise to less suspicion of carrying something. You, Miss Mary, give me that casket, and put on your head this basket of bread. Now that's right. Uh, do you feel you have strength?' "'Yes,' said the queen. "'Yes,' said Mary Seaton. "'Then follow me.' The child went on his way, and after a few steps the fugitives found themselves in a kind of antechamber to the great hall, from which proceeded noise and light. Several servants were occupied there with different duties. Not one paid attention to them, and that a little reassured the queen. Besides, there was no longer any drawing back. Little Douglas had just entered the great hall. The guests, seated on both sides of a long table ranged according to the rank of those assembled at it, were beginning dessert, and consequently had reached the gayest moment of the repast. Moreover, the hall was so large that the lamps and candles which lighted it, multiplied as they were, left in the most favorable half-light both sides of the apartment, in which fifteen or twenty servants were coming and going. The Queen and Mary Seaton mingled with this crowd, which was too much occupied to notice them, and without stopping, without slackening, without looking back, they crossed the whole length of the hall, reached the other door, and found themselves in the vestibule corresponding to the one they had passed through on coming in. The Queen set down her jug there, Mary Seaton her basket, and both— still led by the child, entered a corridor at the end of which they found themselves in the courtyard. A patrol was passing at the moment, but he took no notice of them. The child made his way towards the garden, still followed by the two women. There, for no little while, it was necessary to try which of all the keys opened the door. It was a time of inexpressible anxiety. At last the key turned in the lock, the door opened, the Queen and Mary Seaton rushed into the garden, the child closed the door behind them. About two-thirds of the way across, little Douglas held out his hand as a sign to them to stop. Then, putting down the casket and the keys on the ground, he placed his hands together and, blowing into them, thrice imitated the owl's cry so well that it was impossible to believe that a human voice was uttering the sounds. Then, picking up the casket and the keys, he kept on his way on tiptoe and with an attentive ear. On getting near the wall, they again stopped, and after a moment's anxious waiting, they heard a groan, then something like the sound of a falling body. Some seconds later the owl's cry was answered by a two with two with two It is over, little Douglas said calmly. Come. 
"'What is over?' asked the queen. "'And what is that groan we heard?' "'That was the sentry at the door on to the lake,' the child answered. "'But he is no longer there.' The queen felt her heart's blood grow cold, at the same time that a chilly sweat broke out to the roots of her hair, for she perfectly understood an unfortunate being had just lost his life on her account. Tottering, she leaned on Mary Seaton, who herself felt the strength giving way. Meanwhile, little Douglas was trying the keys. The second opened the door. "'And the queen?' said in a low voice a man who was waiting on the other side of the wall. "'She is following me,' replied the child. George Douglas, for it was he, sprang into the garden, and taking the queen's arm on one side and Mary Seaton's on the other, he hurried them away quickly to the lakeside. When passing through the doorway, Mary Stuart could not help throwing an uneasy look about her, and it seemed to her that a shapeless object was lying at the bottom of the wall, and as she was shuddering all over. "'Do not pity him,' said George in a low voice, "'for it is a judgment from heaven. That man was the infamous warden who betrayed us.' "'Alas,' said the queen, "'guilty as he was, he is none the less dead on my account.' "'When it concerned your safety, madame, was one to haggle over drops of that base blood?' but silence this way william this way let us keep along the wall whose shadow hides us the boat is within twenty steps and we are saved with these words george hurried on the two women who were still more quickly and all four without having been detected reached the banks of the lake as douglas had said a little boat was waiting and on seeing the fugitives approach four rowers couched along its bottom rose and one of them springing to land pulled the chain so that the queen and mary seaton could get in Douglas seated them at the prow, the child placed himself at the rudder, and George, with a kick, pushed off the boat which began to glide over the lake. "'And now,' said he, "'we are really saved, for they might as well pursue a sea-swallow on Solway Firth as to try to reach us. Row, children, row. Never mind if they hear us. The main thing is to get into the open.' "'Who goes there?' cried a voice above from the castle terrace. "'Row, row,' said Douglas, placing himself in front of the queen. "'The boat!' the boat cried the same voice bring to the boat then seeing that it continued to recede treason treason cried the sentinel to arms at the same moment a flash lit up the lake the report of a firearm was heard and a ball passed whistling the queen uttered a little cry although she had no danger george as we have said having placed himself in front of her quite protecting her with his body the alarm bell now rang, and all the castle lights were seen moving and glancing about, as if distracted in the rooms. "'Courage, children,' said Douglas. "'Row as if your lives depended on each stroke of the oar, for ere five minutes the skiff will be out after us.' Uh, "'That won't be so easy for them as you think, George,' said little Douglas, "'for I shut all the doors behind me, and some time will elapse before the keys that I have left there open them. As to these,' added he, showing those he had so skilfully abstracted, I resign them to the Kelpie, the genie of the lake, and I nominate him porter of Lochlaven Castle. The discharge of a small piece of artillery answered William's joke, but as the night was too dark for one to aim to such a distance as that already between the castle and the boat, the ball ricocheted at twenty paces from the fugitives, while the report died away in echo after echo. Then Douglas drew his pistol from his belt, and warning the ladies to have no fear, he fired in the air, not to answer by idle bravado the castle cannonade, but to give notice to a troop of faithful friends who were waiting for them on the other shore of the lake that the queen had escaped immediately in spite of the danger of being so near kinross cries of joy resounded on the bank and william having turned the rudder the boat made for land at the spot whence they had been heard douglas then gave his hand to the queen who sprang lightly ashore and who falling on her knees immediately began to give thanks to god for her happy deliverance on rising the queen found herself surrounded by her most faithful servants hamilton harry's and seaton mary's father light-headed with joy the queen extended her hands to them thanking them with broken words which expressed her intoxication and her gratitude better than the choicest phrases could have done when suddenly turning round she perceived george douglas alone and melancholy then going to him and taking him by the hand my lords said she presenting george to them and pointing to william behold my two deliverers Behold those to whom, as long as I live, I shall preserve gratitude of which nothing will ever acquit me. Madam, said Douglas, each of us has only done what he ought, and he who has risked most is the happiest, but if your majesty will believe me, you will not lose a moment in needless words. Douglas is right, said Lord Seaton, to horse, to horse. 
immediately and while four couriers set out in four different directions to announce to the queen's friends her happy escape they brought her a horse saddled for her which she mounted with her usual skill then the little troop which composed of about twenty persons was escorting the future destiny of scotland keeping away from the village of kinross to which the castle firing had doubtless given the alarm took at a gallop the road to seaton's castle where was already a garrison large enough to defend the queen from a sudden attack the queen journeyed all night accompanied on one side by douglas on the other by lord seaton then at daybreak they stopped at the gate of the castle of west nidri belonging to lord seaton as we have said and situated in west lothian Douglas sprang from his horse to offer his hand to Mary Stuart, but Lord Seaton claimed his privilege as master of the house. The Queen consoled Douglas with a glance and entered the fortress. Madame, said Lord Seaton, leading her into a room prepared for her for nine months, your majesty must have need of repose. After the fatigue and the emotions you have gone through since yesterday morning, you may sleep here in peace, and disquiet yourself for nothing. Any noise you may hear will be made by a reinforcement of friends, which we are expecting. As to our enemies— your majesty has nothing to fear from them so long as you inhabit the castle of a seton the queen again thanked all her deliverers gave her hand to douglas to kiss one last time kissed little william on the forehead and named him her favorite page for the future then profiting by the advice given her entered her room where mary seton to the exclusion of every other woman claimed the privilege of performing about her the duties with which she had been charged during their eleven months captivity in lochlaven castle on opening her eyes Mary Stuart thought she had had one of those dreams so gainful to prisoners, when waking they see again the bolts on their doors and the bars on their windows. So the queen, unable to believe the evidence of her senses, ran half-dressed to the window. The courtyard was filled with soldiers, and these soldiers all friends, who had hastened at the news of her escape. She recognized the banners of her faithful friends, the Setons, the Arbros, the Harrys, and the Hamiltons. And scarcely had she been seen at the window than all these banners bent before her with the shouts a hundred times repeated of Long live Mary of Scotland! Long live our Queen! Then, without giving heed to the disarray of her toilet, lovely and chaste with her emotion and her happiness, she greeted them in her turn, her eyes full of tears, but this time they were tears of joy. However, the Queen recollected that she was barely covered, and blushing at having allowed herself to be thus carried away in her ecstasy, she abruptly drew back, quite rosy with confusion then she had an instant's womanly fright she had fled from lochlaven castle in the douglas livery and without either the leisure or the opportunity for taking women's clothes with her but she could not remain attired as a man so she explained her uneasiness to mary seaton who responded by opening the closets in the queen's room they were furnished not only with robes the measure for which like that of the suit had been taken from mary fleming but also with all the necessities for a woman's toilet the queen was astonished it was like being in a fairy castle mignon said she looking one after another at the robes all the stuffs of which were chosen with exquisite taste i knew your father was a brave and loyal knight but i did not think him so learned in the matter of the toilet we shall name him groom of the wardrobe alas madame smilingly replied mary seaton you are not mistaken my father has had everything in the castle furbished up to the last corselet sharpened to the last sword unfurled to the last banner but my father, ready as he is to die for your majesty, would not have dreamed for an instant of offering you anything but his roof to rest under, or his cloak to cover you. It is Douglas again who has foreseen everything, prepared everything, everything even to Rosabelle, your majesty's favorite steed, which is impatiently awaiting in the stable the moment when, mounted on her, your majesty will make your triumphal re-entry into Edinburgh. "'And how has he been able to get her back again?' Mary asked. I thought that in the division of my spoils Rosabelle had fallen to the fair Alice, my brother's favorite sultana. Yes, yes, said Mary Seaton. It was so, and as her value was known, she was kept under lock and key by an army of grooms. But Douglas is the man of miracles, and as I have told you, Rosabelle awaits your majesty. Noble Douglas, murmured the queen, with eyes full of tears, then as if speaking to herself— and this is precisely one of those devotions that we can never repay the others will be happy with honors places money but to douglas what matter all these things come madam come said mary seaton god takes on himself the debts of kings he will reward douglas as to your majesty reflect that they are waiting dinner for you i hope added she smiling that you will not affront my father as you did lord douglas yesterday in refusing to partake of his feast on his fortunate homecoming and your luck has come to me for it i hope replied mary but you are right darling 
no more sad thoughts. We will consider, when we have indeed become queen again, what we can do for Douglas. The queen dressed and went down. As Mary Seaton had told her, the chief noblemen of her party, already gathered round her, were waiting for her in the great hall of the castle. Her arrival was greeted with acclamations of the liveliest enthusiasm, and she sat down to table, with Lord Seaton on her right hand, Douglas on her left, and behind her little William, who the same day was beginning his duties as page. Next morning the queen was awakened by the sound of trumpets and bugles. It had been decided the day before that she should set out that day for Hamilton, where reinforcements were looked for. The queen donned an elegant riding habit, and soon mounted on Rosabelle appeared amid her defenders. The shouts of joy redoubled. Her beauty, her grace, and her courage were admired by everyone. Mary Stuart became her own self once more, and she felt spring up in her again the power of fascination she had always exercised on those who came near her. Everyone was in good humor, and the happiest of all was perhaps little William, who for the first time in his life had such a fine dress and such a fine horse. Two or three thousand men were awaiting the queen at Hamilton, which she reached the same evening, and during the night following her arrival the troops increased to six thousand. The second of May she was a prisoner, without another friend but a child in her prison, without other means of communication with her adherents than the flickering and uncertain light of a lamp, and three days afterwards, that is to say between the Sunday and the Wednesday, she found herself not only free, but also at the head of a powerful confederacy which counted at its head nine earls, eight peers, nine bishops, and a number of barons and nobles renowned among the bravest of Scotland. The advice of the most judicious among those about the queen was to shut herself up in the strong castle of Dumbarton, which, being impregnable, would give all her adherents time to assemble together, distant and scattered as they were. Accordingly, the guidance of the troops who were to conduct the queen to that town was entrusted to the Earl of Argyll, and the 11th of May she took the road with an army of nearly 10,000 men. Murray was at Glasgow when he heard of the queen's escape. The place was strong, he decided to hold it, and summoned to him his bravest and most devoted partisans. Kirkcaldy of Grange, Morton, Lindsay of Byers, Lord Lochleven, and William Douglas hastened to him, and six thousand of the best troops in the kingdom gathered round them, while Lord Ruthven and the counties of Berwick and Angus raised the levies with which to join them. The 13th of May, Morton occupied from daybreak the village of Langside, through which the Queen must pass to get to Dumbarton. The news of the occupation reached the Queen, as the two armies were yet seven miles apart. Mary's first instinct was to escape an engagement. She remembered her last battle at Carberry Hill, at the end of which she had been separated from Bothwell and brought to Edinburgh. So she expressed aloud this opinion, which was supported by George Douglas, who in black armor without other arms had continued at the Queen's side. "'Avoid an engagement!' cried Lord Seaton, not daring to answer his sovereign, and replying to George as if his opinion had originated with him. "'We could do it, perhaps, if we were one to ten, but we shall certainly not do so when we are three to two. You speak a strange tongue, my young master,' continued he with some contempt, "'and you forget. It seems to me that you are a Douglas, and that you speak to a Seaton.' "'My lord,' returned George calmly, "'when we only hazard the lives of Douglases and Seatons, you will find me, I hope, as ready to fight as you, be it one to ten, be it three to two, but we are now answerable for an existence dearer to Scotland than that of all the Setons and all the Douglases. My advice is then to avoid battle. Battle! Battle! cried all the chieftains. You hear, madame, said Lord Seton to Mary Stuart. I believe that to wish to act against such unanimity would be dangerous. In Scotland, madame, there is an ancient proverb which has it that— there is most prudence in courage. "'But have you not heard that the regent has taken up an advantageous position?' the queen said. "'The greyhound hunts the hare on the hillside as well as in the plain,' replied Seaton. "'We will drive him out, wherever he is.' "'Let it be as you desire, then, my lords. It shall not be said that Mary Stuart returned to the scabbard the sword her defenders had drawn for her.' Then, turning round to Douglas, "'George!' she said to him, "'Choose a guard of twenty men for me, and take command of them. You will not quit me.' George bent low in obedience, chose twenty from among the bravest men, placed the queen in their midst, and put himself at their head. Then the troops, which had halted, received the order to continue their road. In two hours' time the advance guard was in sight of the enemy. It halted, and the rest of the army rejoined it. The queen's troops then found themselves parallel with the city of Glasgow and the heights which rose in front of them were already occupied by a force above which floated, as above that of Mary, the royal banners of Scotland. On the other side and on the opposite slope stretched the village of Langside, encircled with enclosures and gardens. 
The road which led to it, and which followed all the variations of the ground, narrowed at one place in such a way that two men could hardly pass abreast, then farther on lost itself in a ravine, beyond which it reappeared, then branched into two, of which one climbed to the village of Langside, while the other led to Glasgow. On seeing the lie of the ground, the Earl of Argyll immediately comprehended the importance of occupying this village, and, turning to Lord Seaton, he ordered him to gallop off and try to arrive there before the enemy, who doubtless, having made the same observation as the commander of the royal forces, was setting in motion at the very moment a considerable body of cavalry. Lord Seaton called up his men directly, but while he was ranging them round his banner, Lord Arbroath drew his sword and approaching the Earl of Argyll. "'My lord,' said he, you do me a wrong in charging Lord Seaton to seize that post, as commander of the vanguard. It is to me this honor belongs. Allow me, then, to use my privilege in claiming it. It is I who receive the order to seize it. I will seize it, cried Seaton. Perhaps, returned Lord Arbroath, but not before me. Before you and before every Hamilton in the world, exclaimed Seaton, putting his horse to the gallop and rushing down into the hollow road. "'St. Bennet, and forward! Come, my faithful kinsman!' cried the Lord Abroth, dashing forward on his side with the same object. "'Come, my men-at-arms, for God and the Queen!' The two troops precipitated themselves immediately in disorder and ran against one another in the narrow way, where, as we have said, two men could hardly pass abreast. There was a terrible collision there, and the conflict began among friends who should have been united against the enemy— Finally, the two troops, leaving behind them some corpses stifled in the press, or even killed by their companions, passed through the defile pell-mell and were lost sight in the ravine. But during this struggle Seaton and Abroth had lost precious time, and the detachment sent by Murray, which had taken the road by Glasgow, had reached the village beforehand. It was now necessary not to take it, but to retake it. Argyll saw that the whole day's struggle would be concentrated there, and, understanding more and more the importance of the village, immediately put himself at the head of the body of his army, commanding a rear guard of two thousand men to remain there and await further orders to take part in the fighting. But whether the captain who commanded them had ill understood, or whether he was eager to distinguish himself in the eyes of the queen, scarcely had Argyll vanished into the ravine, at the end of which the struggle had already commenced between Kirkcaldy of Grange and Morton on the one side, and on the other between Arbroath and Seaton, then, without regarding the cries of Mary Stuart, he set off in his turn at a gallop, leaving the queen without other guard than the little escort of twenty men which Douglas had chosen for her. Douglas sighed. "'Alas!' said the queen, hearing him. "'I am not a soldier, but there, it seems to me, is a battle very badly begun.' "'What is to be done?' replied Douglas. "'We are every one of us infatuated from first to last, "'and all these men are behaving today like madmen or children.' "'Victory! Victory!' said the Queen. "'The enemy is retreating, fighting. "'I see the banners of Seton and Arbroath "'floating near the first houses of the village. "'Oh, my brave lords!' cried she, clapping her hands. "'Victory! Victory!' "'But she stopped suddenly on perceiving a body "'of the enemy's army advancing to charge the victors in flank.' "'It is nothing, it is nothing,' said Douglas. "'So long as there is only cavalry, we have nothing much to fear, "'and besides the Earl of Argyll will fall in time to aid them.' "'George,' said little William. "'Well?' asked Douglas. "'Don't you see?' the child went on, "'stretching out his arms toward the enemy's force, "'which was coming on at a gallop. "'What?' "'Each horseman carries a footman armed with an arquebus behind him, "'so that the troop is twice as numerous as it appears.' "'That is true.' "'Upon my soul, the child has good sight. "'Let someone go at once, full gallop, "'and take news of this to the Earl or Argyll.' "'Aye, aye,' cried little William. "'I saw them first. "'It is my right to bear the tidings.' "'Go then, my child,' said Douglas, "'and may God preserve thee.' "'The child flew, quick as lightning, "'not hearing or feigning not to hear the Queen, "'who was recalling him. "'He was seen to cross the gorge "'and plunge into the hollow road "'at the moment when Argyll was debouching at the end "'and coming to the aid of Seton and Arbroath. "'Meanwhile, the enemy's detachment had dismounted its infantry, "'which immediately formed up, "'was scattering on the sides of the ravine "'by paths impracticable for horses. "'William will come too late!' cried Douglas. "'Or even, should he arrive in time, "'the news is now useless to them. "'Oh, madmen, madmen that we are! "'This is how we have always lost all our battles!' "'Is the battle lost, then?' demanded Mary, growing pale. Uh, "'No, madam, no,' cried Douglas. "'Heaven be thanked, not yet, but through too great haste we have begun badly.' "'And William?' said Mary Stuart. 
he is now serving his apprenticeship in arms for if i am not mistaken he must be at this moment at the very spot where those marksmen are making such quick firing poor child cried the queen if ill should befall him i shall never console myself alas madam replied douglas i greatly fear that his first battle is his last and that everything is already over for him for unless i mistake there is his horse returning riderless oh my god my god said the queen weeping and raising her hands to heaven it is then decreed that i should be fatal to all around me george was not deceived it was william's horse coming back without his young master and covered with blood madame said douglas we are ill placed here let us gain that hillock on which is the castle of crookstone from thence we shall survey the whole battlefield no not there not there said the queen in terror within that castle i came to spend the first days of my marriage with darnley it will bring me misfortune well beneath that yew tree then said george pointing to another slight rise near the first but it is important for us to lose no detail of this engagement everything depends on perhaps for your majesty on an ill-judged maneuver or a lost moment guide me then said the queen for as for me i no longer see it each report of that terrible cannonade echoes to the depths of my heart however well placed as was this eminence for overlooking from its summit the whole battlefield the reiterated discharge of cannon and musketry covered it with such a cloud of smoke that it was impossible to make out from it anything but masses lost amid a murderous fog at last when an hour had passed in this desperate conflict through the skirts of this sea of smoke the fugitives were seen to emerge and disperse in all directions followed by the victors only at that distance it was impossible to make out who had gained or lost the battle and the banners which on both sides displayed the scottish arms could in no way clear up this confusion at that moment there was seen coming down from the glasgow hillsides all the remaining reserve of murray's army it was coming at full speed to engage in the fighting but this maneuver might equally well have for its object the support of defeated friends as to complete the rout of the enemy however soon there was no longer any doubt for this reserve charged the fugitives amid whom it spread fresh confusion the queen's army was beaten at the same time three or four horsemen appeared on the hither side of the ravine advancing at a gallop douglas recognized them as enemies fly madame cried george fly without loss of a second for those who are coming upon us are followed by others gain the road while i go check them and you added he addressing the escort be killed to the last man rather than let them take your queen george george cried the queen motionless and as if riveted to the spot but george had already dashed away with all his horse's speed and as he was splendidly mounted he flew across the space with a lightning rapidity and reached the gorge before the enemy there he stopped put his lance in rest and alone against five bravely awaited the encounter as to the queen she had no desire to go but on the contrary as if turned to stone she remained in the same place her eyes fastened on this combat which was taking place at scarcely five hundred paces from her suddenly glancing at her enemies she saw that one of them bore in the middle of his shield a bleeding heart the douglas arms then she uttered a cry of pain and drooping her head douglas against douglas brother against brother she murmured it only wanted this last blow madam madam cried her escort there is not an instant to lose the young master of douglas cannot hold out long thus alone against five let us fly let us fly and two of them taking the queen's horse by the bridle put it to the gallop at the moment when george after having beaten down two of his enemies and wounded a third was thrown down in his turn in the dust thrust to the heart by a lance head the queen groaned on seeing him fall then as if he alone had detained her and as if he being killed she had no interest in anything else she put rosabel to the gallop and as she and her troop were splendidly mounted they had soon lost sight of the battlefield she fled thus for sixty miles without taking any rest and without ceasing to weep or to sigh at last having traversed the counties of renfrew and Ayr, she reached the abbey of dundrennan in galloway and certain of being for the time at least sheltered from every danger she gave the order to stop the prior respectfully received her at the gate of the convent i bring you misfortune and ruin father said the queen alighting from her horse they are welcome replied the porter since they come accompanied by duty the queen gave rosabel to the care of one of the men-at-arms who had accompanied her and leaning on mary seaton who had not left her for a moment and on lord harry's who had rejoined her on the road she entered the convent 
Lord Harry's had not concealed her position from Mary Stuart. The day had been completely lost, and with the day, at least for the present, all hope of reascending the throne of Scotland. There remained but three courses for the Queen to take to withdraw into France, Spain, or England. On the advice of Lord Harry's, which accorded with her own feeling, she decided upon the last, and that same night she wrote this double missive in verse and in prose to Elizabeth. "'My dear sister, I have often begged you to receive my tempest-tossed vessel into your haven during the storm. If at this pass she finds a safe harbour there, I shall cast anchor there for ever. Otherwise the bark is in God's keeping, for she is ready and caulked for defence on her voyage against all storms. I have dealt openly with you, and still do so. Do not take it in bad part if I write thus. It is not in defiance of you as it appears, for in everything I rely on your friendship.' This sonnet accompanied the letter. One thought alone brings danger and delight. Bitter and sweet change places in my heart. With doubt and then with hope it takes its part, till peace and rest alike are put to flight. Therefore, dear sister, if this card pursue, that keen desire by which I am oppressed, to see you tis because I live distressed, unless some swift and sweet result ensue. Beheld, I have my ship compelled by fate to seek the open sea when close to port, and calmest days break into storm and gale. Wherefore, full grieved and fearful is my state, not for your sake, but since in evil sort, fortune so oft snaps strongest rope and sail. Elizabeth trembled with joy at receiving this double letter. For the eight years that her enmity had been daily increasing to Mary Stuart, she had followed her with her eyes continually as a wolf might a gazelle. At last the gazelle sought refuge in the wolf's den. Elizabeth had never hoped as much. She immediately dispatched an order to the sheriff of Cumberland to make known to Mary that she was ready to receive her. One morning a bugle was heard blowing on the seashore. It was Queen Elizabeth's envoy come to fetch Queen Mary Stuart. Then arose great entreaties to the fugitive not to trust herself thus to a rival in power, glory, and beauty. But the poor, dispossessed queen was full of confidence in her she called her good sister and believed herself going free and rid of care to take at elizabeth's court the place due to her rank and her misfortunes thus she persisted in spite of all that could be said in our time we have seen the same infatuation seize another royal fugitive who like mary stuart confided himself to the generosity of his enemy england like mary stuart he was cruelly punished for his confidence and found in the deadly climate of st helena the scaffold of fotheringay mary stuart set out on her journey and then with her little following Arrived at the shore of Solway Firth, she found there the warden of the English marshes. He was a gentleman named Lothar, who received the queen with the greatest respect, but who gave her to understand that he could not permit more than three of her women to accompany her. Mary Seaton immediately claimed her privilege. The queen held out her hand. "'Alas, Mignon,' said she, "'but it might well be another's turn. You have already suffered enough for me and with me.' But Mary, unable to reply, clung to her hand, making a sign with her head that nothing in the world should part her from her mistress. Then all who had accompanied the queen renewed their entreaties that she should not persist in this fatal resolve, and when she was already a third of the way along the plank placed for her to enter the skiff, the prior of Dunrennan, who had offered Mary Stuart such dangerous and touching hospitality, entered the water up to his knees to try to detain her, but all was useless. The queen had made up her mind. At that moment, a Luther approached her. Madame, said he, accept anew my regrets that I cannot offer a warm welcome in England to all who would wish to follow you there. But our queen has given us positive orders, and we must carry them out. May I be permitted to remind your majesty that the tide serves? Positive orders, cried the prior. Do you hear, madame? Oh, you are lost if you quit this shore. Back, while there is yet time. Back, madame, in heaven's name. To me, sir knights, to me he cried, turning to Lord Harry's and the other lords who had accompanied Mary Stuart. "'Do not allow your queen to abandon you. Were it needful to struggle with her, and the English at the same time, hold her back, my lords, in heaven's name. Withhold her!' "'What means this violence, Sir Priest?' said the warden of the marches. "'I came here at your queen's express command. She is free to return to you, and there is no need to have recourse to force for that.' Then addressing the queen, "'Madame,' said he, "'do you consent to follow me into England in full liberty of choice? Answer, I entreat you, for my honour demands that the whole world should be aware that you have followed me freely.' "'Sir,' replied Mary Stuart, "'I ask your pardon in the name of this worthy servant of God and his queen, for what he may have said of offence to you. Freely I leave Scotland and place myself in your hands, 
trusting that I shall be free either to remain in England with my royal sister, or to return to France to my worthy relatives. Then turning to the priest, Your blessing, father, and God protect you. Alas, alas, murmured the abbot, obeying the queen, it is not we who are in need of God's protection, but rather you, my daughter. May the blessing of a poor priest turn aside from you the misfortunes I foresee. Go, and may it be with you as the Lord has ordained in his wisdom and in his mercy. Then the queen gave her hand to the sheriff, who conducted her to the skiff, followed by Mary Seaton and two other women only. The sails were immediately unfurled, and the little vessel began to recede from the shores of Galloway, to make her way towards those of Cumberland. So long as it could be seen, they who had accompanied the queen lingered on the beach, waving her signs of adieu, which, standing on the deck of the shallop which was bearing her away, she returned with her handkerchief. Finally the boat disappeared, and all burst into lamentations or into sobbing. They were right, for the good prior of Dundrennan's presentiments were only too true, and they had seen Mary Stuart for the last time. End of chapter 7 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia Chapter 8 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3, by Alexander Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 8 On landing on the shores of England, the Queen of Scotland found messengers from Elizabeth empowered to express to her all the regret their mistress felt in being unable to admit her to her presence, or to give her the affectionate welcome she bore her in her heart. But it was essential, they added, that first of all the Queen should clear herself of the death of Darnley, whose family, being subjects of the Queen of England, had a right to her protection and justice. Mary Stuart was so blinded that she did not see the trap, and immediately offered to prove her innocence to the satisfaction of her sister Elizabeth. But scarcely had she in her hands Mary Stuart's letter, than from arbitress she became judge, and naming commissioners to hear the parties, summoned Murray to appear and accuse his sister. Murray, who knew Elizabeth's secret intentions with regard to her rival, did not hesitate a moment. He came to England, and bringing the casket containing the three letters we have quoted, some verses and some of the papers which prove that the Queen had not only been Bothwell's mistress during the lifetime of Darnley, but had also been aware of the assassination of her husband. On their side, Lord Harry's and the Bishop of Ross, the Queen's advocates, maintained that these letters had been forged, that the handwriting was counterfeited and demanded in a verification experts whom they could not obtain, so that this great controversy remained pending for future ages, and to this hour nothing is yet affirmatively settled in this matter either by scholars or historians. After a five months' inquiry, the Queen of England made known to the parties that, not having in these proceedings been able to discover anything to the dishonor of accuser or accused, everything would remain in status quo till one or the other could bring forward fresh proofs. As a result of this strange decision, Elizabeth should have sent back the regent to Scotland and have left Mary Stuart free to go where she would. But instead of that, she had her prisoner removed from Bolton Castle to Carlisle Castle, from whose terrace to crown with her grief, poor Mary Stuart saw the blue mountains of her own Scotland. However, among the judges named by Elizabeth to examine into Mary Stuart's conduct was Thomas Howard, Duke of Norfolk. Be it that he was convinced of Mary's innocence, be it that he was urged by the ambitious project which since served as a ground for his prosecution, and which was nothing else than to wed Mary Stuart, to affiance his daughter to the young king and to become regent of Scotland, he resolved to extricate her from her prison. Several members of the high nobility of England, among whom were the earls of Westmoreland and Northumberland, entered into the plot and undertook to support it with all their forces. But their scheme had been communicated to the regent. He denounced it to Elizabeth, who had Norfolk arrested. Warned in time, Westmoreland and Northumberland crossed the frontiers and took refuge in the Scottish borders which were favorable to Queen Mary. The former reached Flanders, where he died in exile. The latter, given up to Murray, was sent to the castle of Lochleven, which guarded him more faithfully than it had done its royal prisoner. As to Norfolk, he was beheaded. As one sees, Mary Stuart's star had lost none of its fatal influence. Meanwhile, the regent had returned to Edinburgh, enriched with presents from Elizabeth, and having gained, in fact, his case with her, since Mary remained a prisoner. 
he employed himself immediately in dispersing the remainder of her adherents, and had hardly shut the gates of Lochleven Castle upon Westmoreland than, in the name of the young King James the Sixth, he pursued those who had upheld his mother's cause, and among them more particularly the Hamiltons, who since the affair of sweeping the streets of Edinburgh, had been the mortal enemies of the Douglases personally. Six of the chief members of this family were condemned to death, and only obtained commutation of the penalty into an external exile on the entreaties of John Knox, at that time so powerful in Scotland that Murray dared not refuse their pardon. One of the amnestied was a certain Hamilton of Bothwell Ha, a man of ancient Scottish times, wild and vindictive as the nobles in the times of James I. He had withdrawn into the highlands, where he had found an asylum, when he learned that Murray, who in virtue of the confiscation pronounced against exiles, had given his lands to one of his favorites, had had the cruelty to expel his sick and bedridden wife from her own house, and that without giving her time to dress, and although it was in the winter cold. The poor woman, besides, without shelter, without clothes, and without food, had gone out of her mind, had wandered about thus for some time, an object of compassion, but equally of dread for every one had been afraid of compromising himself by assisting her. At last she had returned to expire of misery and cold on the threshold whence she had been driven. On learning this news, Bothwell Ha, despite the violence of his character, displayed no anger. He merely responded with a terrible smile. "'It is well. I shall avenge her.' Next day Bothwell Ha left his highlands and came down disguised into the plain, furnished with an order of admission from the Archbishop of St. Andrews to a house which this prelate, who as one remembers had followed the Queen's fortunes to the last moment, had at Linlithgow. This house, situated in the main street, had a wooden balcony looking on to the square, and a gate which opened out into the country. Bothwell Howe entered it at night, installed himself on the first floor, hung black cloth on the walls so that his shadow should not be seen from without, covered the floor with mattresses so that his footsteps might not be heard on the ground floor, fastened a racehorse ready saddled and bridled in the garden, hollowed out the upper part of the little gate which led to the open country so that he could pass through it at a gallop, armed himself with a loaded arquebus, and shut himself up in the room. All these preparations had been made, one imagines, because Murray was to spend the following day in Linlithgow. But, secret as they were, they were to be rendered useless, for the regent's friends warned him that it would not be safe for him to pass through the town, which belonged almost wholly to the Hamiltons, and advised him to go by it. However, Murray was courageous, and accustomed not to give way before a real danger, he did nothing but laugh at a peril which he looked upon as imaginary, and boldly followed his first plan, which was not to go out of his way. Consequently, as the street into which the Archbishop of St. Andrew's balcony looked was on his road, he entered upon it, not going rapidly, and preceded by guards who would open up a passage for him, as his friends still counseled, but advancing at a foot's pace delayed as he was by the great crowd which was blocking up the streets to see him, arrived in front of the balcony as if by chance had been in tune with the murderer. The crush became so great that Murray was obliged to halt for a moment. This rest gave Bothwell Ha time to adjust himself for a steady shot. He leaned his arquebus on the balcony, and having taken aim with the necessary leisure and coolness, fired. Bothwell Ha had put such a charge into the arquebus that the ball, having passed through the regent's heart, killed the horse of the gentleman on his right. Murray fell directly, saying, "'My God, I am killed!' As they had seen from which window the shot was fired, the persons in the regent's train had immediately thrown themselves against the great door of the house, which looked on to the street and had smashed it in. But they only arrived in time to see Bothwell Hall fly through the little garden gate on the horse he had got ready. They immediately remounted the horses they had left in the street, and, passing through the house, pursued him. Bothwell Hall had a good horse, and the lead of his enemies, and yet four of them, pistol in hand, were so well mounted that they were beginning to gain upon him. Then Bothwell Hall, seeing the whip and spur were not enough, drew his dagger and used it to goad on his horse. His horse, under this terrible stimulus, acquired fresh vigor, and leaping a gully eighteen feet deep, put between his master and his pursuers a barrier which they dared not cross. The murderer sought an asylum in France, where he retired under the protection of the Guises. There, as the bold stroke he had attempted had acquired him a great reputation, some days before the massacre of St. Bartholomew they made him overtures to assassinate Admiral Coligny. But Bothwell Ha indignantly repulsed these proposals, saying that he was the avenger of abuses and not an assassin, and that those who had to complain of the Admiral had only to come and ask him how he had done and to do as he. As to Murray, 
He died the night following his wound, leaving the regency to the Earl of Lennox, the father of Darnley. On learning the news of his death, Elizabeth wrote that she had lost her best friend. While these events were passing in Scotland, Mary Stuart was still a prisoner, in spite of the pressing and successive protests of Charles the Ninth and Henry the Third. Taking fright at the attempt made in her favour, Elizabeth even had her removed to Sheffield Castle, round which fresh patrols were incessantly in motion. But days, months, years passed, and poor Mary, who had been borne so impatiently her eleven months' captivity in Lochleven Castle, had been already led from prison to prison for fifteen or sixteen years, in spite of her protests and those of the French and Spanish ambassadors, when she was finally taken to Tutbury Castle, and placed under the care of Sir Amias Paulet, her last jailer. There she found for her sole lodging two low and damp rooms, where little by little what strength remained to her was so exhausted that there were days on which she could not walk on account of the pain in all her limbs. Then it was that she who had been the queen of two kingdoms, who was born in a gilded cradle and brought up in silk and velvet, was forced to humble herself to ask of her jailer a softer bed and warmer coverings. This request, treated as an affair of state, gave rise to negotiations which lasted a month, after which the prisoner was at length granted what she asked. And yet the unhealthiness, cold, and privations of all kinds still did not work actively enough on that healthy and robust organization. They tried to convey to Paulet what a service he would render the Queen of England in cutting short the existence of her, who, already condemned in her rival's mind, yet delayed to die. But Sir Amias Paulet, coarse and harsh as he was to Mary Stuart, declared that, so long as she was with him, she would have nothing to fear from poison or dagger, because he would taste all the dishes served to his prisoner, and that no one should approach her but in his presence. In fact, some assassins sent by Leicester, the very same who had aspired for a moment to the hand of the lovely Mary Stuart, were driven from the castle directly its stern keeper had learned with what intentions they had entered it. Elizabeth had to be patient then, in contenting herself with tormenting her, whom she could not kill, and still hoping that a fresh opportunity would occur for bringing her to trial. That opportunity so long delayed, the fatal star of Mary Stuart at length brought. A young Catholic gentleman, a last scion of that ancient chivalry which was already dying out at that time, excited by the excommunication of Pius V, which pronounced Elizabeth fallen from her kingdom on earth and her salvation in heaven, resolved to restore liberty to Mary, who thenceforth was beginning to be looked upon no longer as a political prisoner but as a martyr for her faith. Accordingly, braving the law which Elizabeth had had made in 1585, and which provided that if any attempt on her person was meditated by or for a person who thought he had claims to the crown of England, a commission would be appointed composed of twenty-five members, which, to the exclusion of every other tribunal, would be empowered to examine into the offence, and to condemn the guilty persons, whosoever they might be. Babington, not at all discouraged by the example of his predecessors, assembled five of his friends, Catholics as zealous as himself, who engaged their life and honour in the plot of which he was the head, and which had as its aim to assassinate Elizabeth, and as a result to place Mary Stuart on the English throne. But this scheme, well planned as it was, was revealed to Walsingham, who allowed the conspirators to go as far as he thought he could without danger, and who, the day before that fixed for the assassination, had them arrested. This imprudent and desperate attempt delighted Elizabeth, for, according to the letter of the law, it finally gave her rival's life into her hands. Orders were immediately given to Sir Amias Paulet to seize the prisoner's papers and to move her to a Fotheringay castle. The jailer, then hypocritically relaxing his usual severity, suggested to Mary Stuart that she should go riding, under the pretext that she had need of an airing. The poor prisoner, who for three years had only seen the country through her prison bars, joyfully accepted, and left Tutbury between two guards, mounted, for greater security, on a horse whose feet were hobbled. These two guards took her to Fotheringay Castle, her new habitation, where she found the apartment she was to lodge and already hung in black. Mary Stuart had entered alive into her tomb. As to Babington and his accomplices, they had been already beheaded. Meanwhile her two secretaries, Curl and Now, were arrested and all her papers were seized and sent to Elizabeth, who, on her part, ordered the forty commissioners to assemble, and proceed without intermission to the trial of the prisoner. They arrived at Fotheringay, the 14th October, 1586. The next day, being assembled in the great hall of the castle, they began the examination. 
At first, Mary refused to appear before them, declaring that she did not recognize the commissioners as judges, they not being her peers and not acknowledging the English law, which had never afforded her protection, and which had constantly abandoned her to the rule of force. But, seeing that they proceeded none the less, and that every calumny was allowed, no one being there to refute it, she resolved to appear before the commissioners. We quote the two interrogatories to which Mary Stuart submitted, as they are set down in the report of M. de Bellievre to M. de Villeroy. M. de Bellievre, as we shall see later, had been specially sent by King Henry III to Elizabeth. Intelligence for M. Villeroy of what was done in England by M. de Bellievre was about the affairs of the Queen of Scotland in the months of November and December 1586 and January 1587. The said lady being seated at the end of the table in the said hall, and the said commissioners about her. The Queen of Scotland began to speak in these terms. I do not admit that any one of you here assembled is my peer or my judge to examine me upon any charge. Thus what I do, and now tell you, is of my own free will, taking God to witness, that I am innocent and pure in conscience of the accusations and slanders of which they wish to accuse me, for I am a free princess, and born a queen obedient to no one save to god to whom alone i must give an account of my actions this is why i protest yet again that my appearance before you be not prejudicial either to me or to the kings princes and potentates my allies nor to my son and i require that my protest be registered and i demand the record of it then the chancellor who was one of the commissioners replied in his turn and protested against the protestation then he ordered that there should be read over to the Queen of Scotland the commission in virtue of which they were proceeding, a commission founded on the statutes and law of the kingdom. But to this, Mary Stuart made answer that she again protested, that the said statutes and laws were without force against her, because these statutes and laws are not made for persons of her condition. To this, the Chancellor replied that the commission intended to proceed against her, even if she refused to answer, and declared that the trial should proceed, for she was doubly subject to indictment, the conspirators having not only plotted in her favour, but also with her consent to which the said Queen of Scotland responded, that she had never even thought of it. Upon this, the letters it was alleged she had written to Babington and his answers were read to her. Mary Stuart then affirmed that she had never seen Babington, that she had never had any conference with him, had never in her life received a single letter from him, and that she defied any one in the world to maintain that she had ever done anything to the prejudice of the said Queen of England. That besides, strictly guarded as she was, away from all news, withdrawn from and deprived of those nearest her, surrounded with enemies, deprived finally of all advice, she had been unable to participate in or to consent to the practices of which she was accused that there are besides many persons who wrote to her what she had no knowledge of, and that she had received a number of letters without knowing whence they came to her. Then Babington's confession was read to her, but she replied that she did not know what was meant, that besides, if Babington and his accomplices had said such things, they were base men, false, and liars. Besides, added she, show me my handwriting and my signature. Since you say that I wrote to Babington, and not copies counterfeited like these which you have filled at your leisure, with the falsehoods it has pleased you to insert. Then she was shown the letter that Babington, it was said, had written her. She glanced at it, then said, I have no knowledge of this letter. Upon this she was shown her reply, and she said again, I have no more knowledge of this answer. If you will show me my own letter and my own signature containing what you say, I will acquiesce in all. But up to present, as I have already told you, you have produced nothing worthy of credence, unless it be the copies you have invented and added to with what seemed good to you. With these words, she rose and with her eyes full of tears. If I have ever, said she, consented to such intrigues, having for object my sister's death, I pray God that he have neither pity nor mercy on me. I confess that I have written to several persons, that I have implored them to deliver me from my wretched prisons, where I languished, a captive and ill-treated princess, for nineteen years and seven months, but it never occurred to me, even in thought, to write or even to desire such things against the Queen. Yes, I also confess to having exerted myself for the deliverance of some persecuted Catholics, and if I had been able, and could yet with my own blood, protect them and save them from their pains. I would have done it. 
and would do it for them with all my power in order to save them from destruction then turning to the secretary walsingham but my lord said she from the moment i see you here i know whence comes this blow you have always been my greatest enemy and my sons and you have moved every one against me and to my prejudice thus accused to his face walsingham rose madame he replied i protest before god who is my witness that you deceive yourself and that i have never done anything against you unworthy of a good man either as an individual or as a public personage this is all that was said and done that day in the proceedings till the next day when the queen was again obliged to appear before the commissioners and being seated at the end of the table of the said hall and the said commissioners about her she began to speak in a loud voice you are not unaware my lords and gentlemen that i am a sovereign queen anointed and consecrated in the church of god and cannot and ought not for any reason whatever be summoned to your courts or called to your bar to be judged by the law and statutes that you lay down for i am a princess and free and i do not owe to any prince more than he owes to me and on everything of which i am accused towards my said sister i cannot reply if you do not permit me to be assisted by counsel and if you go further do what you will but from all your procedure in reiterating my protestations i appeal to god who is the only just and true judge and to the kings and princes my allies and confederates this protestation was once more registered as she had required of the commissioners then she was told that she had further written several letters to the princes of christendom against the queen and the kingdom of england as to that replied mary stuart it is another matter and i do not deny it and if it was again to do i should do as i have done to gain my liberty for there is not a man or woman in the world of less rank than i who would not do it and who would not make use of the help and succor of their friends to issue from a captivity as harsh as mine was you charge me with certain letters from babington well i do not deny that he has written to me and that i have replied to him but if you find in my answers a single word about the queen my sister well yes there will be good cause to prosecute me i replied to him who wrote to me that he would set me at liberty that i accepted his offer if he could do it without compromising the one or the other of us and that is all as to my secretaries added the queen not they but torture spoke by their mouths and as to the confessions of babington and his accomplices there is not much to be made of them for now that they are dead you can say all that seems good to you and let who will believe you with these words the queen refused to answer further if she were not given counsel and renewing her protestation she withdrew into her apartment but as the chancellor had threatened the trial was continued despite her absence however m de chateauneuf the french ambassador to london saw matters too near at hand to be deceived as to their course accordingly at the first rumour which came to him of bringing mary stuart to trial he wrote to king henry the third that he might intervene in the prisoner's favour Henry the Third immediately dispatched to Queen Elizabeth an embassy extraordinary, of which M. de Bellievre was the chief, and at the same time, having learned that James the Sixth, Mary's son, far from interesting himself in his mother's fate, had replied to the French minister, Corcel, who spoke to him of her. "'I can do nothing. Let her drink what she has spilled.' He wrote him the following letter, to decide the young prince to second him in the steps he was going to take. 21st November, 1586. Corsella, I have received your letter of the 4th October last, in which I have seen the discourse that the King of Scotland has held with you concerning what you have witnessed, to him of the good affection I bear him, discourse in which he has given proof of desiring to reciprocate it entirely. But I wish that that letter had informed me also that he was better disposed towards the Queen, his mother, and that he had the heart and the desire to arrange everything in a way, to assist her in the affliction which she now is reflecting that the prison where she has been unjustly detained for eighteen years and more has induced her to lend an ear to many things which have been proposed to her for gaining her liberty a thing which is naturally greatly desired by all men and more still by those who are born sovereigns and rulers who bear being kept prisoners thus with less patience he should also consider that if the queen of england my good sister allows herself to be persuaded by the counsels of those who wish that she should stain herself with queen mary's blood it will be a matter which will bring him to great dishonour, 
inasmuch as one will judge that he will have refused his mother the good offices that he should render her with the said Queen of England, and which would have perhaps been sufficient to move her, if he would have employed them as warmly and as soon as his natural duty commanded him. Moreover, it is to be feared for him that his mother dead his own turn may come, and that one may think of doing as much for him, by some violent means, as to make the English succession easier to seize for those who are likely to have it after the said Queen Elizabeth, and not only to defraud the said King of Scotland of the claim he can put forward, but to render doubtful even that which he has to his own crown. I do not know in what condition the affairs of my said sister-in-law will be when you receive this letter, but I will tell you that in every case I wish you to rouse strongly the said King of Scotland, with remonstrances and everything else which may bear on this subject, to embrace the defence and protection of his said mother, and to express to him on my part, that, as this will be a matter for which he will be greatly praised by all the other kings and sovereign princes, he must be assured that if he fails in it there will be great censure for him, and perhaps a notable injury to himself in particular. Furthermore, as to the state of my own affairs, you know that the Queen, Madam and Mother, is about to see very soon the King of Navarre, and to confer with him on the matter of the pacification of the troubles of this kingdom, to which, if he bear as much good affection as I do for my part, I hope that things may come to a good conclusion, and that my subjects will have some respite from the great evils and calamities that the war occasions them. Supplicating the Creator, Corsella, that he may have you in his holy keeping. Written at St. germain en laye the 21st day of November, 1586, signed Henry, and below, Bruyard. This letter finally decided James the Sixth to make a kind of demonstration in his mother's favor. He sent Gray, Robert Melville, and Keith to Queen Elizabeth. But although London was nearer Edinburgh than was Paris, the French envoys reached it before the Scotch. It is true that on reaching Calais, the 27th of November, Monsieur de Bellievre had found a special messenger there to tell him not to lose an instant, from Monsieur de Chateauneuf, who, to provide for every difficulty, had chartered a vessel ready in the harbor. But, however great the speed these noble lords wished to make, they were obliged to wait the wind's good will, which did not allow them to put to sea till Friday the 28th at midnight. Next day also, on reaching Dover at nine o'clock, they were so shaken by seasickness that they were forced to stay a whole day in the town to recover, so that it was not till Sunday the 30th that Monsieur de Bellievre was able to set out in the coach that Monsieur de Chateauneuf sent him by Monsieur de Braglion and take the road to London accompanied by the gentlemen of his suite, who rode on post-horses, but resting only a few hours on the way to make up for lost time, they arrived at last in London, Sunday the 1st of December at midday. Monsieur de Bellievre immediately sent one of the gentlemen of his suite, named Monsieur de Villiers, to the Queen of England, who was holding her court at Richmond Castle. The decree had been secretly pronounced already six days and submitted to Parliament, which was to deliberate upon it with closed doors. The French ambassadors could not have chosen a worse moment to approach Elizabeth, and to gain time she declined to receive M. de Villiers, returning the answer that he would himself know the next day the reason for this refusal. And indeed, next day, the rumor spread in London that the French embassy had contagion, and that two of the lords in it having died of the plague at Calais, the queen, whatever wish she might have to be agreeable to Henry III, could not endanger her precious existence by receiving his envoys. Great was the astonishment of Monsieur de Bellievre at learning this news. He protested that the Queen was led into error by a false report, and insisted on being received. Nevertheless, the delays lasted another six days. But as the ambassadors threatened to depart without waiting longer, and as upon the whole Elizabeth, disquieted by Spain, had no desire to embroil herself with France, she had Monsieur de Bellievre informed on the morning of the 7th of December that she was ready to receive him after dinner at Richmond Castle, together with the noblemen of his suite. At the appointed time the French ambassadors presented themselves at the castle gates, and having been brought to the queen, found her seated on her throne and surrounded by the greatest lords in her kingdom. Then Messieurs de Chateauneuf and de Bellievre, or the one the ambassador in ordinary, and the other the envoy extraordinary, having greeted her on the part of the King of France, began to make her the remonstrances with which they were charged. Elizabeth replied, not only in the same French tongue, but also in the most beautiful speech in use at that time, and carried away by passion, pointed out to the envoys of her brother Henry that the Queen of Scotland had always proceeded against her, and that this was the third time that she had wished to attempt her life by an infinity of ways, which she had already borne too long and with too much patience, but that never had anything so profoundly cut her to the heart as her last conspiracy, 
that event added she with sadness having caused her to sigh more and to shed more tears than the loss of all her relations so much the more that the queen of scotland was her near relative and closely connected with the king of france and as in their remonstrances messieurs de chateauneuf and de bellievre had brought forward several examples drawn from history she assumed in reply to them on this occasion of the pedantic style which was usual with her and told them that she had seen and read a great many books in her life and a thousand more than others of her sex in her rank were wont to but that she had never found in them a single example of a deed like that attempted on her a deed pursued by a relative whom the king her brother could not and ought not to support in her wickedness when it was on the contrary his duty to hasten the just punishment of it then she added addressing herself specially to monsieur de bellievre and coming down again from the height of her pride to a gracious countenance that she greatly regretted he was not deputed for a better occasion that in a few days she would reply to king henry her brother concerning whose health she was solicitous as well as that of the queen mother who must experience such great fatigue from the trouble she took to restore peace to her son's kingdom and then not wishing to hear more she withdrew into her room the envoys returned to london where they awaited the promised reply but while they were expecting it unavailingly they heard quietly the sentence of death given against queen mary which decided them to return to richmond to make fresh remonstrances to the queen elizabeth after two or three fruitless journeys they were at last december fifteenth admitted for the second time to the royal presence the queen did not deny that the sentence had been pronounced and as it was easy to see that she did not intend in this case to use her right of pardon m de bellievre judging that there was nothing to be done asked for a safe conduct to return to his king elizabeth promised it to him within two or three days on the following tuesday the seventeenth of the same month of december parliament as well as the chief lords of the realm were convoked at the palace of westminster and there in full court and before all sentence of death was proclaimed and pronounced against mary stuart then the same sentence with great display and great solemnity was read in the squares and at the cross-roads of london whence it spread throughout the kingdom and upon this proclamation the bells rang for twenty-four hours while the strictest orders were given to each of the inhabitants to light bonfires in front of their houses as is the custom in france on the eve of st john the baptist then amid the sound of bells by the light of these bonfires m de bellievre wishing to make a last effort in order to have nothing with which to reproach himself wrote the following letter to Queen Elizabeth. Madame, we quitted your majesty yesterday, expecting, as it had pleased you to inform us, to receive in a few days your reply touching the prayer that we made you on behalf of our good master, your brother, for the Queen of Scotland, his sister-in-law and confederate. But as this morning we have been informed that the judgment given against the said Queen has been proclaimed in London, although we had promised ourselves another issue from your clemency and the friendship you bear to the said lord king your good brother nevertheless to neglect no part of our duty and believing in so doing to serve the intentions of the king our master we have not wanted to fail to write to you this present letter in which we supplicate you once again very humbly not to refuse his majesty the very pressing and very affectionate prayer that he has made you and that you will be pleased to preserve the life of the said lady queen of scotland which the said lord king will receive as the greatest pleasure your majesty could do to him while on the contrary he could not imagine anything which would cause him more displeasure and which would wound him more than if he were used harshly with regard to the said lady queen being what she is to him and as madame the said king our master your good brother when for this object he dispatched us to your majesty had not conceived that it was possible in any case to determine so promptly upon such an execution we implore you madam very humbly before permitting it to go further to grant us some time in which we can make known to him the state of the affairs of the said queen of scotland in order that before your majesty takes a final resolution you may know what it may please his very christian majesty to tell you and point out to you on the greatest affair which in our memory has been submitted to men's judgment monsieur de saint cyr who will give these presents to your majesty will bring us if it pleases you your good reply London, the 16th day of December, 1586, signed de Bellievre and de Laubespine Chateauneuf. The same day, M. de St. Cyr and the other French lords returned to Richmond to take this letter, but the Queen would not receive them, alleging indisposition, so that they were obliged to leave the letter with Walsingham, her first Secretary of State, who promised them to send the Queen's answer the following day. 
In spite of this promise, the French lords waited two days more. At last, on the second day towards evening, two English gentlemen sought out Monsieur de Bellievre in London, and Viva Voce, without any letter to confirm what they were charged to say, announced to him, on behalf of their queen, that in reply to the letter that they had written her, and to do justice to the desire they had shown to obtain for the condemned a reprieve, during which they would make known the decision of the King of France, Her Majesty would grant twelve days. As this was Elizabeth's last word, and it was useless to lose time in pressing her further, Monsieur de jean was dis immediately dispatched to His Majesty the King of France, to whom, besides the long dispatch of Monsieur de Chateauneuf and de Bellievre, which he was charged to remit, he was to say viva voce what he had seen and heard relative to the affairs of Queen Mary during the whole time he had been in England. Henry the Third responded immediately with a letter containing fresh instructions from Messieurs de Chateauneuf and de Bellievre, but in spite of all the haste Monsieur de Genlis could make, he did not reach London till the fourteenth day, that is to say, forty-eight hours after the expiration of the delay granted. Nevertheless, as the sentence had not yet been put into execution, Messieurs de Bellievre and de Chateauneuf set out at once for Greenwich Castle, some miles from London, where the Queen was keeping Christmas, to beg her to grant them an audience in which they could transmit to Her Majesty their King's reply. But they could obtain nothing for four or five days. However, as they were not disheartened, and returned unceasingly to the charge, January 6th, Messieurs de Bellievre and de Chateauneuf were at last sent for by the Queen. As on the first occasion, they were introduced with all the ceremonial in use at the time, and found Elizabeth in an audience chamber. The ambassadors approached her, greeted her, and Monsieur de Bellievre began to address to her with respect, but at the same time with firmness, his master's remonstrances. Elizabeth listened to them with an impatient air, fidgeting in her seat. Then at last, unable to control herself, she burst out, rising and growing red with anger. "'Monsieur de Bellievre, said she, are you really charged by the king, my brother, to speak to me in such a way? Yes, madame, replied Monsieur de Bellievre, bowing. I am expressly commanded to do so. And have you this command under his hand? continued Elizabeth. Yes, madame, returned the ambassador with the same calmness. And the king, my master, your good brother, has expressly charged me in letters, signed by his own hand, to make to your majesty the remonstrances which I have had the honour to address to you. Well, cried Elizabeth, no longer containing herself, I demand of you a copy of that letter, signed by you, and reflect that you will answer for each word that you take away or add. Madame, answered Monsieur de Bellievre, it is not the custom of the kings of France or of their agents to forge letters or documents. You will have the copies you require tomorrow morning, and I pledge their accuracy on my honor. Enough, sir, enough, said the queen, and signing to everyone in the room to go out, she remained nearly an hour with Messieurs de Chateauneuf and de Bellievre. No one knows what passed in that interview, except that the queen promised to send an ambassador to the king of France, who she promised would be in Paris, if not before, at least at the same time as Monsieur de Bellievre, and would be the bearer of her final resolve as to the affairs of the queen of Scotland. Elizabeth then withdrew, giving the French envoys to understand that any fresh attempt they might make to see her would be useless. On the 13th of January, the ambassadors received their passports and at the same time noticed that a vessel of the Queen's was awaiting them at Dover. The very day of their departure a strange incident occurred. A gentleman named Stafford, a brother of Elizabeth's ambassador to the King of France, presented himself at Monsieur de Trapps, one of the officials in the French Chancellery, telling him that he was acquainted with a prisoner for debt, who had a matter of the utmost importance to communicate to him, and that he might pay the greater attention to it. He told him that this matter was connected with the service of the King of France, and concerned the affairs of Queen Mary of Scotland. Monsieur de Trapps, although mistrusting this overture from the first, did not want, in case his suspicions deceived him, to have to reproach himself for any neglect on such a pressing occasion. He repaired then, with Mr. Stafford, uh, to the prison, where he who wished to converse with him was detained. When he was with him, the prisoner told him that he was locked up for a debt of only twenty crowns, and that his desire to be at liberty was so great that if Monsieur de Chateauneuf would pay that sum for him, he would undertake to deliver the Queen of Scotland from her danger by stabbing Elizabeth. To this proposal, Monsieur de Trapps, who saw the pitfall laid for the French ambassador, was greatly astonished, and said that he was certain that Monsieur de Chateauneuf would consider as very evil every enterprise, having its aim to threaten in any way the life of Queen Elizabeth or the peace of the realm. Then, not desiring to hear more, he returned to Monsieur de Chateauneuf, 
and related to him what had just happened. Monsieur de Chateauneuf, who perceived the real cause of this overture, immediately said to Mr. Stafford that he thought it strange that a gentleman like himself should undertake with another gentleman such treachery, and requested him to leave the embassy at once, and never to set foot there again. Then Stafford withdrew, and appearing to think himself a lost man, he implored M. de Treps to allow him to cross the channel with him and the French envoys. M. de Treps referred him to M. de Chateauneuf, who answered Mr. Stafford directly that he had not only forbidden him his house, but also all relations with any person from the embassy, that he must thus very well see that his request could not be granted. He added that if he were not restrained by the consideration he desired to keep for his brother, the Earl of Stafford, his colleague, he would at once denounce his treason to Elizabeth. The same day Stafford was arrested. After this conference, M. de Trapps set out to rejoin his traveling companions, who were some hours in advance of him, when on reaching Dover he was arrested in his turn and brought back to prison in London. Interrogated the same day, M. de Trapps frankly related what had passed, appealing to M. de Chateauneuf as to the truth of what he said. The day following there was a second interrogatory, and great was his amazement when, on requesting that the one of the day before should be shown him, he was merely shown, according to custom in English law, counterfeit copies, in which were avowals compromising him as well as M. de Chateauneuf. He objected and protested, refused to answer or to sign anything further, and was taken back to the tower with redoubled precaution, the object of which was the appearance of an important accusation. Next day, M. de Chateauneuf was summoned before the Queen, and there confronted with Stafford, who impudently maintained that he had treated of a plot with M. de Trapps and a certain prisoner for debt, a plot which aimed at nothing less than endangering the Queen's life. M. de Chateauneuf defended himself with the warmth of indignation, but Elizabeth had too great an interest in being unconvinced even to attend to the evidence. She then said to M. de Chateauneuf that his character of ambassador alone prevented her having him arrested like this accomplice, M. de Trapps, and immediately dispatching, as she had promised, an ambassador to King Henry III, she charged him not to excuse her for the sentence which had just been pronounced and the death which must soon follow, but to accuse M. de Chateauneuf of having taken part in a plot of which the discovery alone had been able to decide her to consent to the death of the Queen of Scotland, certain as she was by experience that so long as her enemy lived her existence would be hourly threatened. On the same day Elizabeth made haste to spread, not only in London, but also throughout England, the rumour of the fresh danger from which she had just escaped, so that when two days after the departure of the French envoys, the Scottish ambassadors, who, as one sees, had not used much speed, arrived, the Queen answered them that their request came unseasonably, at a time when she had just had proof that so long as Mary Stuart existed, her own, Elizabeth's, life was in danger. Robert Melville wished to reply to this, but Elizabeth flew into a passion, saying that it was he, Melville, who had given the King of Scotland the bad advice to intercede for his mother, and that if she had such an adviser she would have him beheaded, to which Melville answered— that at the risk of his life he would never spare his master good advice, and that, on the contrary, he who would counsel a son to let his mother perish would deserve to be beheaded. Upon this reply Elizabeth ordered the Scotch envoys to withdraw, telling them that she would let them have her answer. Three or four days passed, and as they heard nothing further, they asked again for a parting audience to hear the last resolve of her to whom they were sent. The queen then decided to grant it, and all passed, as with M. de Bellievre, in recriminations and complaints. Finally, Elizabeth asked them what guarantee they would give for her life in the event of her consenting to pardon the Queen of Scotland. The envoys responded that they were authorized to make pledges in the name of the King of Scotland their master, and all the lords of his realm, that Mary Stuart should renounce in favor of her son all her claims upon the English crown and that she should give as security for this undertaking the king of france and all the princes and lords his relations and friends to this answer the queen without her usual presence of mind cried what are you saying melville that would be to arm my enemy with two claims while he has only one does your majesty then regard the king my master as your enemy replied melville he believed himself happier madame and thought he was your ally uh, no, no, Elizabeth said, blushing. It is a way of speaking, and if you find a means of reconciling everything, gentlemen, to prove to you, on the contrary, that I regard King James the Sixth as my good and faithful ally, I am quite ready to incline to mercy. Seek, then, on your side, added she, 
while I seek on mine. With these words she went out of the room, and the ambassadors retired, with the light of the hope of which she had just let them catch a glimpse. The same evening a gentleman at the court sought out the master of Grey, the head of the embassy, as if to pay him a civil visit, and while conversing said to him, that it was very difficult to reconcile the safety of Queen Elizabeth with the life of her prisoner, that besides, if the Queen of Scotland were pardoned, and she or her son ever came to the English throne, there would be no security for the lords, commissioners, who had voted her death, that there was then only one way of arranging everything, that the King of Scotland should himself give up his claims to the Kingdom of England, that otherwise, according to him, there was no security for Elizabeth in saving the life of a Scottish queen. The master of Grey, then, looking at him fixedly, asked him if his sovereign had charged him to come to him with his talk. But the gentleman denied it, saying that all this was on his own account and in the way of opinion. Elizabeth received the envoys from Scotland once more, and then told them that after having well considered she had found no way of saving the life of the Queen of Scotland while securing her own, that accordingly she could not grant it to them. To this declaration the master of Grey replied, that since it was thus he was in this case ordered by his master to say that they protested in the name of King James, that all that had been done against his mother was of no account, seeing that Queen Elizabeth had no authority over a queen, as she was her equal in rank and birth, that accordingly they declared that immediately after their return, and when their master should know the result of their mission, he would assemble his parliament and send messengers to all the Christian princes to take counsel with them as to what could be done to avenge her whom they could not save. Then Elizabeth again flew into a passion, saying that they had certainly not received from their king a mission to speak to her in such a way, but they thereupon offered to give her this protest in writing under their signatures, to which Elizabeth replied that she would send an ambassador to arrange all, that with her good friend and ally, the king of Scotland. But the envoys then said that their master would not listen to any one before their return, upon which Elizabeth begged them not to go away at once because she had not yet come to her final decision upon this matter. On the evening following this audience, Lord Hingley, having come to see the Master of Grey, and having seemed to notice some handsome pistols which came from Italy, Grey, directly he had gone, asked this nobleman's cousin to take them to him as a gift from him. Delighted with this pleasant commission, the young man wished to perform it the same evening, and went to the Queen's palace, where his relative was staying, to give him the present which he had been told to make to him. But hardly had he passed through a few rooms than he was arrested, searched, and the arms he was taking were found upon him. Although these were not loaded, he was immediately arrested, only he was not taken to the tower, but kept a prisoner in his own room. Next day there was a rumor that the Scottish ambassadors had wanted to assassinate the Queen in their turn, and that pistols given by the Master of Grey himself had been found on the assassin. This bad faith could not but open the envoy's eyes. Convinced at last that they could do nothing for poor Mary Stuart, they left her to her fate, and set out next day for Scotland. Scarcely were they gone than Elizabeth sent her secretary, Davison, to Sir Amias Paulet. He was instructed to sound him again with regard to the prisoner, afraid, in spite of herself, of a public execution, the Queen had reverted to her former ideas of poisoning or assassination. But Sir Amias Paulet declared that he would let no one have access to Mary but the executioner who must in addition be the bearer of a warrant perfectly in order. Davison reported this answer to Elizabeth, who while listening to him stamped her foot several times, and when he had finished unable to control herself, cried, God's death, there's a dainty fellow always talking of his fidelity and not knowing how to prove it. Elizabeth was then obliged to make up her mind. She asked Davison for the warrant, he gave it to her, and forgetting that she was the daughter of a queen who had died on the scaffold, she signed it without any trace of emotion. Then, having affixed to it the great seal of England, Go, said she, laughing, tell Walsingham that all is ended for Queen Mary. But tell him with precautions, for as he is ill, I am afraid he will die of grief when he hears it. The jest was the more atrocious in that Walsingham was known to be the Queen of Scotland's bitterest enemy. Towards evening of that day, Saturday the 14th, Bale, Walsingham's brother-in-law, was summoned to the palace. The queen gave into his hands the death warrant, and with it an order addressed to the earls of Shrewsbury, Kent, Rutland, and other noblemen in the neighborhood of Fotheringay to be present at the execution. Beale took with him the London executioner whom Elizabeth had had dressed in black velvet for this great occasion, and set out two hours after he had received his warrant.
End of chapter 8. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.